Hey everyone, my name is Jeff Ajewski, and today I'm going to be talking about how we build distributed systems for deep learning with Docker at Salesforce. I'm a software engineer at Salesforce where I work on distributed systems for machine learning. And I spend most of my time in the design and implementation of one of our systems for serving deep learning models. And the goal of this system is inference, not training. We uh, need a system that can keep up with the demands of our customers' data. So they're sending us a lot of data, and we want to run that data through some of our deep learning models and then return those results back to the customers. And as, as we'll see in this talk, that's actually a fairly difficult problem. Uh, as you can see, I'm not too active on social media, um, but I do have LinkedIn, and uh, I'm, I'm much more active on GitHub. Uh, so if you want to get in contact with me, I guess LinkedIn is probably the best approach. Uh, I guess I do have a Twitter account, uh, but I haven't touched it in years. <laughs> okay, so a few quick caveats. Firstly, these are my own views and opinions, not those of Salesforce. I, I'm not giving this talk on behalf of Salesforce. I just happen to be an engineer that works there. Also, this is how a single team at Salesforce deploys deep learning models. Uh, we have a lot of teams doing deep learning at Salesforce, and uh, we all have uh, some very different approaches to how to tackle this. In, in a lot of those scenarios, how we deploy these models is uh, dependent on the environment in which we're working. Next, and this one's kind of a funny one, but when I use the term Docker, I want to make it clear, I'm referring to the technology and not the company. I think that will be pretty obvious, but I've been told this is an important point I need to make on this in this presentation. And lastly, uh, the, this, the designs that we'll cover here are somewhat simplified. And I think that'll be kind of clear, and I'll try to point that out as we move along. Uh, but if you catch yourself thinking, like, maybe something's missing here, or, uh, this does not seem very efficient, that's likely because the design I'm presenting is simplified. And the purpose of that is uh, it makes the talk a little bit more accessible. The goal here isn't to get into the weeds of uh, how this specific distributed system works, but more about uh, kind of the driving concepts that kind of guided the design of the system. Okay, so let's do a quick overview of the talk. First, we'll cover what deep learning is and why it's so difficult. Uh, this is not going to be a very in-depth overview of deep learning, just a quick description of it, basically. I don't assume any knowledge on machine learning, any, no mathematical knowledge, or anything of that matter. But it's important that we at least all understand what, what I mean when I say deep learning. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about how we do deep learning at Salesforce. And then the core of the talk is going to be around these three challenges in building systems for deep learning. And then lastly, we'll have a few key takeaways. Okay, so what is deep learning? The core task of deep learning is function approximation. And this is done using a neural network. It's not really important uh, what exactly a neural network is, uh, just that these neural networks can approximate, I say here, any function. Um, it's not technically true, that it's a very large class of functions. So if you think of like uh, the, the task of you're a, a human looking at a picture and trying to determine is it a picture of a cat or is it a dog? Now, that occurs in our brain, so it's some kind of chemical process uh, that leads us to the correct answer. And this is a very simple task for humans. Now, imagine we had a perfect mathematical model of that process. So maybe that model looks something like you have, uh, I don't know, all the different chemicals uh, in your brain, their, their concentrations, all of that stuff. I don't know much about brain biology, as you can tell. But the point is, we model the system exactly. And we have a mathematical function that takes all of those inputs and uh, basically models the process in the brain of those chemical gradients changing, fluctuating, the synapses firing, all of that that leads to the thought in our head that this is a picture of a cat or this is a picture of a dog. So that function, it surely exists because we can 
do this task. Uh, now, of course, we could never know what that function is, but the point of deep learning is we can approximate that function with a neural network. So that's all that's going on here. When, when you hear people talking about all this crazy deep learning stuff, or you're reading all these news articles about uh, deep learning this or neural networks that, that's, that's all these things are doing. So uh, when you think of a, a, a great application of deep learning is uh, self-driving cars. So these cars are using neural networks for a number of tasks, but an easy one is, let's say, pedestrian detection. So these neural networks are simply trying to learn a function that takes an input, let's say an image of what's in front of the car, and determine, is there a pedestrian in that image? Now, what makes this so difficult? Well, neural networks are very expensive to evaluate. Uh, if you think of like a linear regression, which is probably the go-to statistical model that a lot of people use, um, especially Excel users, you know, that's, that's kind of what, what you see in Excel is uh, people fitting lines to their data points and then reporting on the R squared values. So in the, the simplest case, you know, maybe your linear regression line is Y equals MX plus B, uh, just a, a line in a two-dimensional plane. Now, we can also think of much larger linear regression models. For example, suppose uh, we want to run linear regression on maybe a thousand inputs. Now, that may seem large or hard to think about conceptually, but think of this. A 30 by 30 pixel image has 900 pixels. Now, if we were to fit that, plug that image into a linear regression model, I don't know why we would do that. But we could do it. We could flatten the image out into one long vector of pixels, plug that into our linear regression model. Well, now we have a 900 dimensional input into some statistical model. Now, the point of this is that high dimensional inputs, like here I'm talking about a thousand, uh, they're actually quite natural. They, they come up uh, quite often, and pictures are a great example of that. Now, with a linear regression model, the number of parameters in the model is usually equal to the dimension or the size of its input, possibly plus one. So if we have a 1,000 dimensional input to our linear regression model, our linear regression model will have about 1,000 parameters. On the other hand, a deep neural network can have on the order of 100 million. Uh, there are models that have over a billion parameters. So these models are anywhere from 100,000 to a million times larger than a linear regression model. And we can start to think about this as if we have a single data point that we're going to plug into a linear regression model. If we were to plug that same data point into our deep learn neural network, uh, you know, it might, the, in terms of runtime, evaluating that neural network might take the same amount of time as evaluating 100,000 or a million linear regression models. So these neural networks, they give us a lot of power, but that comes at a cost. Um, okay, so hopefully that kind of gives you a quick overview of deep learning and the problems there. The question I want to tackle in this talk is how we should design distributed systems for deep learning. But really, this talk is about high latency tasks. Now, I'll be focusing, of course, on deep learning. But the ideas and uh, designs in this talk are more widely applicable to just any task in general that is very expensive. Uh, in this case, that expensive task is evaluating a neural network. OK, so what about deep learning at Salesforce? Well, we use deep learning models to provide our customers with uh, information about their sales process. So the customers basically give us a, a fire hose of data that's coming in. Uh, we have this huge source of streaming data, and the customers would like us to uh, extract patterns and look for useful information in that data and return it to them as soon as possible. And, and that's really the, a key point here, is the, the faster we can get the information back to the customers, the more valuable it is to them. And that's part of what makes this problem so difficult. Now, we are going to think about this 
process in three steps. And these three steps are, are pretty largely applicable to any kind of data analysis. Um, so this isn't specific, these three steps aren't specific to Salesforce, of course. Uh, the first step is pre-processing. And a lot of time in is spent in this stage in the in investigation period. So uh, we have a data science team that's exploring, looking for patterns in the data. And they probably spend a bulk of their time in pre-processing. And this pre-processing is just cleaning the data, formatting it, getting it ready to uh, plug into whatever the statistical model is. And in, in this case, of course, it's a deep learning model. The inference stage is running that data through the model. So we have I don't know, some, some numbers, we plug them into the model, and the model spits out some, some other numbers. Those output numbers then are fed into the post-processing stage where we interpret the output of the model. So to summarize these three steps, pre-processing, we're kind of like cleaning the data, getting it uh, formatted correctly. Inference is evaluating our model, so evaluating this neural network. And then post-processing is interpreting what that result means. All right, so we have here a, a kind of like a data flow diagram of this process. So the input here we have, hello, my cat is friendly. We're sending that into the pre-process stage. And that pre-process stage returns a vector of four numbers. Uh, this is called an embedding vector, and this is part of uh, natural language processing. Uh, a lot of these NLP neural networks use this embedding vector as an input. Uh, so th we pre-process it into that format, feed that into the neural network, and the neural network spits out two numbers. Now, this is specific to this example. The neural network can spit out whatever it wants. Uh, that, that depends on how you've built your neural network, of course. So here we have two numbers, 0.85 and 0.15, and we have no clue what that means. We need to feed those into the post-process stage, and that's what tells us, uh, the, the neural network is telling us that this sentence discusses a cat. Now at Salesforce, we have two teams. We have a data science team, and this team is focused on these three stages, the pre-process, inference, and post-process. This team uh, spends their day kind of uh, building models and testing ideas on the data that the customers are sending us. And they're looking for useful pieces of information that they can extract from the data uh, in near real time and send back to the customers. Then we have a systems team. That's the team I'm on. And, and the goal of this team is to build systems to serve or deploy the models that the data science team comes up with in a scalable manner. And this leads us into the first challenge. And that is, how can we design a distributed system for team specialization? So we have a couple requirements here. The data science team, they don't really need to know about the system. And they're also not particularly interested in distributed systems. All they want is to define a sequence of computation and have that executed and have the result of that computation sent to the customer. Uh, on the other hand, the systems engineers don't really need to know anything about the computation and they also aren't as interested in machine learning as the data science team is. All they really want to do is, is build distributed systems. So we have these two teams kind of with differing interests and also differ very different work. Uh, and we want to design this system so that they don't really have to overlap at all. There's a couple challenges here. Firstly, some of these functions, and by functions I'm referring back to the pre-process inference and post-process functions, will take longer to execute than others. Uh, for example, the model inference very clearly is going to take longer than other functions, but maybe pre-process is hitting some external services like a database or maybe a couple databases. Uh, that is probably going to take longer than the post-process stage, which might just be executing some policy, like uh, in the prior slide we saw 0.85 and 0.15. Uh, the whatever the 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 first element 
corresponds to discusses cat. Maybe the second element corresponds to discusses dog. Whichever one's greater, that's the prediction. So it's a very simple policy to execute. The other challenge, and this is maybe the main challenge, is the order of execution is very important. Now, that seems simple. The challenge here is we don't want to have to communicate this order of, order of execution between the teams. So what I mean by that is there, we, don't, we want to avoid the scenario where the data science team says, okay, uh, you, you execute this function and take the output of this function and send it into some other function. That, that's just a, a disaster waiting to happen. Okay, so what's our solution? Well, the solution here is to map these functions into containers. And this is where we're getting to a simplified design, so we're not actually mapping all these functions into their own container. Uh, so if you're alarmed, just wait a few minutes and, and all, all will make more sense. Uh, okay, so we have these three functions, preprocess, inference, and postprocess. And we can think of executing those as nested function calls. So we call preprocess on our input. That's the innermost function call. The output of that is then fed into inference. And that output is then fed into postprocess. Now we can map preprocess into its own container, inference into its own container, and postprocess into its own container. Now, this has a number of advantages. One, we can scale each of these stages independently of the others. The other uh, requirement and advantage here is the inference stage requires specialized hardware. Uh, it's very common to run deep learning models on GPUs or other types of accelerators. Now, those computers uh, are usually very expensive um, if, from like a cloud provider and yeah, much more expensive than a CPU instance. So we don't want to run everything on the GPU instance because uh, that will result in very large bills very quickly too. So uh, we want to minimize basically the usage of those types of resources. Now in reality, we don't map every function to a container. We, you can think of it really as kind of like mapping resource requirements to the container. Okay, so now let's think about throughput. So here we have uh, a data flow and we've got some input data that's being piped into preprocess. That's being piped into inference, which is then being piped into postprocess, and we have our results. Okay, so Suppose this data is being sent to us at 1,000 QPS, and preprocess can only handle about 500 QPS. Inference, let's say, is 300 QPS, and postprocess, 1,000. The, the beauty here is we can very easily scale out each of these stages independently of the others with Docker. Uh, so here, we've got two processes now, uh, or say two containers running the preprocess function. We have four running inference, which is technically more than we need, but it gives us some breathing room. And we don't have to scale out the postprocess function at all. Now, internally, we use Kafka in between each of these containers. And this gives us a solution to a classical problem in, in distributed systems and that's of s distributed snapshots. Now, we're not really talking about a snapshot here, uh, but Kafka allows us to checkpoint after each of these stages, and this is important. Uh, for example, suppose we have a failure at the post-process stage. Well, we don't want to repeat the pre-process and inference stages uh, just to get back to recover that post-process stage. So if the post-process container fails, and we just have to restart it. It rereads from Kafka, and we're we're back up and running. That's it's very valuable in these types of systems, uh, because although this specific diagram is very simple, in real life these systems have many more stages and are much more complex.
So this stage-wise checkpointing is actually quite valuable. Okay. The next challenge we have in building distributed systems for deep learning is interacting with the model servers. Model servers provide us a way to query the model, and this is typically done via gRPC and HTTP. Both TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are the main frameworks for deep learning, uh, they, they both provide model server implementations. The question is, what's the best way to deploy these and interact with these model servers? And there's a few challenges here. Uh, first, model servers are typically designed as a standalone process. Uh, so while it's technically possible to modify these servers and call them from within your code, uh, and for us that would be within uh, Kotlin, uh, it's probably more work than is worthwhile. Uh, and in fact, PyTorch's documentation on their model server even suggests that typically uh, the, the model server is deployed in a container. The second challenge is utilizing multiple GPUs. Uh, so typically on high-end GPU instances from most cloud providers, you get more than one GPU. Uh, usually it's about eight GPUs. And at least now, the current state of model servers, uh, the recommendation is to deploy a single model server per GPU. So on an eight GPU machine, uh, the expectation is you have eight model servers, each mapped to a specific GPU. Now, NVIDIA has a framework, TensorRT, and that apparently works quite well with multiple GPUs. So in that setting, you could use a single TensorRT process, and it'll efficiently make use of all available GPUs. But uh, I think that it's still in relatively early stages of development. Uh, and the last challenge is networking. And by that, I mean, how do we figure out where the model server is? Uh, uh, maybe the first thing that comes to mind is a service mesh, but that increases complexity quite a bit, uh, especially if you're a smaller organization. You might not have the resources to dedicate someone to all these additional services. Okay, so how can we simplify some of this? Uh, we want to make sure that whatever our design is, uh, deployment is very simple. Ideally, we would like to make modifications, uh, run our CI CD process, and everything's out and running. Uh, the simpler our deployment is, the easier it is to roll back changes if we run into issues. So, the solution we have here is we run a manager process on the JVM, and that process is responsible for communicating with Kafka. And we deploy all of these images as part of a, a pod or a group. And uh, the advantage here is uh, that, firstly, the model servers are now all co-located with the JVM manager, which means networking between each of those model servers can be done via localhost. So that's, that's a major advantage. We don't need to worry about leaving the machine. And uh, we know that for each of those model servers, uh, the address is just localhost at whatever the mapped port is. The other advantage here is because we're avoiding external network communication, we don't have to worry about uh, security in the sense of making sure that if we're pinging the model server on another machine or maybe even a, another data center, uh, we would need to encrypt the data. Uh, another advantage here is, as I mentioned earlier, we are using Kafka in between each of our stages in this pipeline. And uh, as I also mentioned, the model servers, are we typically interact with them via gRPC or HTTP. So adding this managing process as a separate container uh, makes it very simple to uh, act as kind of like a relay between Kafka and the model servers without having to modify the model server code itself. This also solves uh, a few extra challenges. For example, who owns the model server? Uh, in our case, that's the data science team. Uh, so the problem here is the model servers, like any piece of software, have versions. And we want to make sure that the version of the model server that the data science team is using matches the version of the model server uh, in production. So by putting the model server in its own container, we let the data science team decide what version they want to use, and they can use that version testing locally. Uh, 
Uh, and then on the systems end, all we need is uh, the container image inversion. So once that's specified, we just update our deployment scripts and that's taken care of. Another challenge is handling model versions. And by model, I'm referring to our deep learning models. Uh, these are not changing rapidly, but they will change. Uh, for example, a customer data is not stagnant as maybe customers move into new domains or um, their sales teams change, the underlying distribution of their data will also change, which means we want to update our models uh, either to involve incorporate those changes or maybe to incorporate new state-of-the-art changes in deep learning research. So we need a way to uh, handle model versioning, but we also don't want to bake these model versions into the model servers uh, because these models are built and trained on customer data. We are very protective of that. Um, so our solution here is using ephemeral storage on our uh, shared instances. So the manager process will pull in new model versions uh, from a remote store somewhere and we have a shared volume between that manager and the model servers. So the model servers can access these uh, new versions, and if anything happens to the machine, we don't really have to worry about cleanup. And lastly, addresses of the model servers are, are simple. As I mentioned, uh, we can hit them via localhost, uh, so we can avoid any kind of service discovery uh, interactions, which is a, a great, I mean, service discovery is, is a great tool. It's a great thing to add into your systems, but as I mentioned earlier, that's an extra layer of complexity that uh, maybe isn't something everyone is ready for. And this brings us to our last challenge, and that's testing. Testing is, is a, a huge topic. We could probably cover uh, a whole talk just on testing. Uh, so I'll keep this somewhat brief and focus on two key problems that we had to tackle. And the first is that these deep learning models are probabilistic models. And what that means is we can't have a, like a fixed golden test data set. Uh, and by that I mean we have a fixed set of data that we use to test our deep learning models. The problem is when the deep learning models are updated, they might be better but give different results on that golden test data set. Uh, so we don't want... Uh, the model's accuracy on the test data set to impact, uh, for example, integration tests. The other problem we have to deal with is the inter-service reactions interactions can be quite complex. Uh, for example, maybe in the pre-processing stage, uh, we're hitting a number of external services like databases or uh, data stores, and we need to make sure we capture those interactions during testing. And the solution here is Docker Compose. And if you haven't used Docker Compose, I recommend uh, that you go out and check it out today. It's an incredibly useful tool, and it really simplifies a, a lot of our testing and development process. Uh, so for the first challenge, the uh, problem of dealing with the probabilistic deep learning models, uh, using Docker Compose, it's very easy for us to swap out the actual model server with a mock service. So, uh, for example, maybe we have a deep learning model that will take as input a picture and return as output whether it's a cat or a dog. Uh, we can swap out that model server for a mock server that uh, will take as input that picture, but maybe looks for a specific watermark or looks for a specific pattern in the input data, and based on that pattern returns an expected result. So this means uh, we have no randomness to our tests, which is, is uh, very, very important. Uh, the other nice thing here with Docker Compose is we can deploy our entire system and interactions, uh, you know, if we have interactions with uh, Cassandra or maybe Postgres, uh, we can deploy that entire system locally and guarantee that the versions we're using locally match the versions we're using in production. Uh, so that gives us some uh, extra confidence in our local tests before we start rolling out deployments. And lastly, and this is a big one actually, uh, 
Docker Compose integrates really well with Maven and Gradle. Uh, so one thing you want to avoid in uh, your builds and unit tests is requiring any kind of specialized environment. Uh, you don't want to require a user prior to building uh, your code base to set up some kind of like test environment. Uh, so what we can do with Docker Compose is integrate it with Maven and Gradle so that during the build process, we run all of our unit tests, and then for integration tests, it'll set up our test environment with uh, various services, run those tests, and then at the end of the integration test phase, it'll tear down that environment. It's an extremely useful tool. Okay, so we're nearing the end of the talk here, and uh, we haven't really spent a lot of time discussing the details of Docker. and Really, that's the point of this talk. So Docker lets us uh, focus more on the design of our system and the interactions of the services rather than how we're going to package up those individual services. Uh, and that's really important when you're dealing with much larger, more complex systems. You don't want to spend your time thinking about Docker and how to use it. Docker is an excellent tool. Uh, you want to use it and have it just get out of your way. And that's exactly what it does. Uh, the alternative, uh, not using any kind of container solution, uh, while possible, it, it adds a huge layer of complexity to your system. Uh, and that's not something I, I personally would want to deal with. Uh, if you've ever tried to install a TensorFlow on your machine for uh, using a GPU and dealing with getting the right CUDA libraries, it is a headache, uh, and doing that on a production fleet of systems, uh, that's not something I want to deal with, and Docker takes care of that for us. Um, I can say, at least during the design of our system, there were a number of conversations we had where we were wondering uh, how we were going to handle certain interaction. For example, what happens if the model server dies? And... Uh, it actually turned out that it was kind of like a non-issue. Uh, we knew we were using Docker, and uh, we knew that we could just deploy these things as a pod, or uh, if you're using Nomad, maybe as a, a group. And uh, model server failures are taken care of automatically by the orchestration system. So it's a very useful technique. And that concludes the talk. I really appreciate you guys uh, following along, and hopefully you got something out of this.